Hi, I'm ML Matt Buckman, and thanks for joining me for five insider factoids. And these are based on questions from readers um, about Night Stalkers number three, Wait Until Dark. Let's jump right in. This character, uh, this heroine, Connie, was is actually a character in hindsight. And I'll explain that in just a sec. But first, I mentioned in the last video that there are distinct roles that I was playing with. The roles that women have to take to, or had to take, hopefully less so now, in order to survive and thrive in a male society. And so Connie is the girl next door. She's the little sister. She's the one that people sort of take care of. She's pretty, she's quiet. And so that's her role. And her strength is that she's got a photographic memory. So she's, if she sees how a helicopter is put together, which she did working at Sikorsky, then she knows how to take it apart. And she'll remember where the systems are and how they overlap and what things look like and across time. But she hides it because everybody thinks she's weird every time they find out about it because it's such an odd, it does exist, but it's not very common. Um, her shortcomings are she is terrible with people. She understands machines. She's good at machines. And I explained this by her being orphaned at a young age, military father, uh, ailing grandmother. Um, so she's had to pull herself up by her own bootstraps and she's had this gift of this odd memory and has used that to make her way into the military and work into the military. She's also oddly enough decided that helicopters that she's made her living on and she specifically focuses on are the demon because they killed her father and she doesn't have all the facts but they because it's all secret but she's out there to conquer the demon machine that she assumes will take her life someday and her that shortcoming was actually in a very strange way a character in hindsight in that my current heroine of my Miranda Chase series, she's autistic and she doesn't have a photographic memory, but she remembers facts and figures really well. And all she sees is plain. She doesn't understand people because she's autistic and emotions are weird and people are weird and planes she can reach out and wrap her hands around. She understands planes. Um, I didn't even think of she's also orphaned quite young she's also orphaned within about a year of the same age i hadn't thought of that till this moment but connie in retrospect in hindsight now that i've done a decade more research on autism since i wrote this book is probably autistic or somewhere on that spectrum or really close to that spectrum um she doesn't understand people's emotions. She's poor at interaction. She's real. She has a area of special interest and she has focused her life and her being on that narrow slice of life, which is one of the things many autistics do. So, uh, and she doesn't know, she doesn't understand her emotions. Her emotions surprise her and she doesn't know what to do with them a lot. And so she, she'll push them away. And part of that's because she was raised an orphan and has had to take care of herself since she was 12. But part of that could be that she was a precursor to Miranda. So when I was back looking at this book to make this video, a couple of the, I found a couple of these odd questions also from myself of like, oh, that's inter an interesting parallel. Because I wrote this in probably 2010, maybe 2011. And I started researching Miranda in 2016 and publishing her in 2019, something like that. So there was a gap there that I didn't see as an author, even though it probably is true. <laughs> Just thought I'd pass that on. Race was a big issue in this book, and I didn't think it would be. Big John is, he's 
based on Gordon Duncan Clark and Ving Rhames and those the the big male jovial outgoing uh, guy who comes from a big family. He's he's was set up to be the antithesis of little white quiet Connie, and I had so much fun writing his family because they are just mayhem. They're sisters and cousins and aunts and in-laws and odd marriages structures. And there's a mom who kind of rules everything, even though the dad kind of thinks he does. And um, so it, it's all this big thing that, of course, is way out of Connie's league because she's solo. She doesn't have even friends. I mean, she's a solo act. So immersing her in John's world seemed like a great contrast. And I didn't think twice about making an interracial couple until the editor said, you can't do that. I will not buy this book if you do that. You have to remove. And it was like, excuse me? This is 2012. What are we, why are we pushing back against an interracial couple? And she said, it's because your buyers, your readers, have now been taught by two whole books that the um, that it's white white relationships. Oh, did that set me off? And I wish I had had the guts to fight back. I was a newbie author. It was my first contract. She was talking about a second contract. Um, I was finally starting to get sales, so I had all these hopes wrapped up in this. And so I folded and I removed any reference to color. I didn't change its voice. I didn't change their interactions. I didn't change the language. I didn't change that they were an Oki farming family. And she picked up on grandpa's hair was curly and gray. I had to take out the word curly. However, um, I've since gotten the rights back. And so now you get to read it in its original intended form. But the other thing that happened was that I was very pleased with myself for is I kept the rights to short books in the world. So I gave that publisher the rights to the long novels, but short novels were still mine. So I started writing these short novels that included John being this big black guy with a with a small, cute white wife and the two of them interacting and she's the genius of the family and he's the jovial of the family. And um, so I kind of, you know, got my own back, but boy, was I irritated that that had happened and that I let that go. However, it all worked out for the best because I got the rights back and now it's the way it was meant to be. I, I got a number of questions about why I use setting the way I do. And in, in this book, uh, particularly, setting set up conflict, setting set up a lot of issues. And like the crash of her father, the supposed crash of her father, um, when she was 12, that killed him. And he supposedly burned as the burned alive in the helicopter which we find out at the end isn't how it happened. Um, that's what sets her Connie on this path of, I need to take care of this. I need to. And so in the opening scene of this book, she hears the mechanics coming apart on the helicopter. She's aboard in a war zone and John confirms it, but she's the first one to hear it because she's got that weird memory thing going on. And She's like, oh, okay, it finally caught up with me. It's finally going to kill me. And it's only when others start saying, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do that? But she's like, oh, well, maybe we can get past this. And so it's using that crash and then the repairs coming out of that, the, the helicopters just beat to crap and they have another mission they have to do. So she and John, who've been completely at odds up until this point, have to do this repair together and they have to do it incredibly fast. Well, they're both top, 
top mechanics. So they find a piece through the only medium that she understands, which is the mechanics. It is the repair. It is the helicopter. And they start finding a connection there. Then along comes this then brand new technology called ADIS, um, Advanced Distributed Aperture System. What it what they did was they put cameras all over the outside of the helicopter and then projected the image seamlessly on the pilot's helmet, on the visor. And so as the pilot turns their head, his head, his or her head, they can see everything around them, not just what's through the windshield, but they can see the night vision sensing of, oh, there's somebody over there. They can look straight down through the floor and see as if they're sitting in a chair in space. Um, I think it's since been, been renamed the RDAS because Raytheon created it. So it's the Raytheon distributed aperture system. But what happens is it lets them, again, we're getting into the, that heavy mechanical world of Connie and we're looking at Suddenly she can see things when they're testing it. She can see John's face without him realizing it because she's looking through the helicopter's eye, not through John's. And he happens to be standing in the hangar. And so again, it's using setting to, and she freaks because she recognizes the look on his face as attraction. And she doesn't know what to do with that. Further in, they get into more conflict and things get more tense and they're playing this fierce poker game, which is nothing to do with the poker. It's yeah, it's a, it's a bloody nasty game with fierce betting and um, lack of trust. And, but it's all about the relationship breaking apart rather than being about the game of poker. Even St. George and the Dragon in the Swedish Cathedral, which is magnificent if you're ever in Stockholm, don't miss it. Um, I had the good fortune to go and see that. Suddenly we have the hero conquering the demon. And so it's Connie and John together conquering the demon in front of St. George and the Dragon conquering the demon. And so I love these parallels and using the setting to not as setting, but as an element of the people's growth and evolution or conflict. Little dose of reality here. Um, there's always a plot in these books. And for me, it's probably almost always going to be geopolitical or philosophical or something. Um, this one's about the nukes left in Ukraine, which supposedly there aren't any. And this is way before the Ukraine war. This was written before Russia grabbed Crime, uh, Crimea in 2014. It's based on shortly after the Soviet breakup, the Ukraine said, we don't want to be responsible for all these nukes that Russia, that Russia had forward positioned for the Soviet Union in the Ukraine. Back then it was the Ukraine. Now it's just Ukraine. Um, <laughs> but so they gave them to Russia. They said, here, take them. Well, but they were very corrupt countries. So on an index of 100, Ukraine at that time had, an in, had a corruption index of 25. It's not a very good score. There are worse ones. And if you want the least corrupt, it's Denmark, which is a score of something like 90. Um, but, and over time, they've grown up to 33, but I thought, what about that corruption? Maybe they hung on to a couple nukes. And that became the plot of the story of following that. Russia, post-Soviet Union was corrupt and it still is corrupt. And just to give you a reference, um, the US was, we had a 75% rating, we're about 20th of 160 nations in the index. In the four years of 2016 to 2020, that slid down by 
eight points and it's recovered a little by 2022, but we still have some work to do. Anyway, um, this is what set the plot was the corruption index and the nukes and the interaction between the Russia and its former Soviet satellites. Just to give you a background of where that came from. And the last one is the submarine. I love this submarine. I had decided that my hero, John Wallace, was a farmer from Muskogee, Oklahoma. I have no idea why I decided that. I've never been to Muskogee. Um, and so I was out there looking, you know, what's amusing? What What is in that town that would make a cool setting that'll, that'll give it a bit of a feeling of reality? And um, I discovered that the USS Batfish, the number one hunter of Japanese submarines, I think it's sunk three in one day, um, confirmed kills of Japanese submarines, is sitting in Muskogee, Oklahoma. And it's not just in Muskogee, it's like 20 or 30 feet up in a park. And it, it, these submarines, they're not light. <laughs> they're huge boats, they're heavy boats. And the story of how they got it there is just hilarious. They were first supposed to get a different boat, and for some reason they didn't. And they finally said, well, can we get the batfish? And um, Army Corps of Engineers, who I think had it, uh, no, the Navy had it at that point, and it was decommissioned. And they said, okay, we, you know, let's run it up the Mississippi to you. Well, that one place, the Army Corps actually had to lower the Mississippi by three feet so the mast could get under a bridge, and they they towed this thing all the way up the river to Muskogee. And then what they do is they cut this huge notch into the hillside of the park, and they dug it out so it flooded from the river. They sailed the uh, push, the submarine, into this huge notch, and they filled the back of the notch with dirt. So it had trapped this big pool of water with a submarine floating in it, and they started dumping water into the hole and or start dumping dirt into the hole. And so what happened was as the dirt settled to the bottom, it slowly filled and raised the level of the pool of water with a submarine floating in it all the way up to the level of the park. And then they drained off the water and the submarine went clunk down onto some support rests in the dirt. And there's the batfish sitting in the middle of the Muskogee War Memorial Park in Oklahoma. So I just, I had to use it as a setting. It was just too cool. I made up the night before the night before banquet. My hope is someday they'll read my book and start doing that. But the joke is that the batfish floated again. It wasn't enough that did it in World War II and then in the, I think it was the 50s or 60s to get up to Muskogee. There was a big flood in 2019. And there's a little URL there that if, if you want to see the video, but the whole park above the river, the river got so high that the park flooded, the batfish floated and twisted around. And um, then what happened was because of how the currents worked, it actually swung back into place and settled back on its the piers that the concrete piers that were keeping it straight and level. So it's almost exactly where they had parked it before the flood, but it, it did this little floating trick first. And now they're talking about they um, there's some building coming up that's going to make basically wipe out the park. So what they're going to do is they're probably going to lower this submarine back down and um, park it back in the river as a mu continuing to be a museum and build a museum along the pier beside it for the other artifacts. But I just, I love this submarine. It just has a whole life of its own. So I thought I'd share that. Thanks for sticking with me through this. Hope you enjoyed it. Go visit the site. There's all kinds of good freebie stuff, bonus scenes, stories, maps of where the stories have taken place. Um, 
Really appreciate it. Hope to see you at the next video. Take care.